everybody. Um, I guess you know me. So I'm Jo Grace. I run a thing called the Sensory Projects. And this event that you're attending um, ha first happened, this is our fourth one. And it first happened about two and a half years ago now. And the reason that it happened is because I took a position as a doctoral researcher researching identity and belonging for people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities funded by the ESRC through the South Coast Doctoral Training Partnership and at the start of my PhD I was being expected to read lots and lots of books by people and research by people and I am still being expected to read lots of books by people and research by people and I was stood at my desk one day thinking just be so much easier to talk to them and it was it was a bit of kind of hazy procrastination I thought oh I would much rather be listening to people who have an insight because some of the books that I was reading were not particularly relevant to people with profound and multiple learning disabilities and some of the papers that I were reading again like they might mention them but it, I was like I want to just hear from people who know about this and who live this and who are passionate about this and so in a kind of hazy daydream avoiding my work kind of a way I just sent an email to everybody that I could think of who I would like to listen to and said hey uh, um, I, would you record like a half hour of you talking about this because I'd like to listen to it and I think other people would too and, and I'll make an event out of it and I, I didn't when I sent the email, I don't think I really meant it um, because when I got the replies, I'd forgotten that I'd sent it and that I got loads of people going, yeah, sure, yeah, we'd do that, Joe." And so the first event was just this wonderful surprise where all these people came and shared. And then you'll know it's snowballed since then. So this event is because I'm doing a PhD and I thought as I come up to the end of my PhD, I ought to pop up and tell you what I've been doing. And I build my talk as being about inclusive research, I think. But I, what I want to say to you is three sort of separate things. Firstly, I want to explain why I'm doing the doctorate. And then I want to tell you a bit about inclusive research. And then I'll tell you about what I've been up to, if, if you want to know. Um, so early on in my role at the sensory projects um, and again I'm assuming a lot of knowledge I'm sorry but those of you who know me which is pretty much everybody who's attending this event so thank you very much for coming um, will know that I'm a big research geek and when I set up the sensory projects I wanted the work that I did to be founded on the research evidence that we have for things because I think that people with profound disabilities have as much right to research informed practice as the next person and they deserve that and the, the problem is there's often not enough research to always be able to offer research informed practice and things don't become research informed practice without first being just ideas that were tried out so it's not that anything that's not research informed is bad it, it could be heading that way it's just because when you're supporting vulnerable populations they're vulnerable in lots and lots of different ways. And one of the ways in which they're vulnerable is that they're vulnerable to being sold snake oil. You know, if somebody comes along and wants to make a fast buck, they can go, here's this thing, it's good for autism, or here's this thing, it, it's sensory and it's good for profoundism, and people will buy it because the people who are buying it care deeply for the people that these other people have said it's for, and so they're willing to risk it. So it's a great way of making money. And I've, I've had conversations with people who say, yeah, we buy this stuff in and we put the word autism with it and then we triple the price. And that's how we make our profits. So it's not... I tend to have a very rosy view of the world. And I have to remind myself that this is something that happens. So that's me reminding myself. And so my, my initial, like interest in the research aside from me being a geek was just I wanted to make sure that what I was doing was based off more than just my bright ideas that there was some kind of evidence base for it and in the early days of the sensory projects I remember somebody 
more senior to me, counselling me and saying, just leave all that research stuff alone, Joe, and get on with doing the job. You know, stop bothering about the research and get on with doing the job. And I was really shocked at the time. I recognise now that what they were saying is there's a lot of enormously good practice that isn't there in the research. So if all you're focusing on is research informed practice, you're going to miss this great stuff. But I would rather then have said, you know, get that great stuff into the research archive. And then just recently somebody said to me, I don't know why you feel the need to prove yourself by doing this PhD. And I was really um, disorientated by that because I hadn't considered that I was doing something to prove myself. And I found um, in, in the reading that I've had to do around the doctorate, which has partly been about reading about people with profound intellectual disabilities, but a lot of it has been reading about the stuff I don't know, the stuff that I need to know in order to be able to study for a PhD. And start up was research methodology. I am the daughter of two people who studied physics at Oxford. So I'm very much from a hard science, natural science background. And so research methodology to me is you have a theory and then you come up with a way of testing the theory and then you test it and repeat those tests and then you decide on what, you know, that's the research, that's the scientific method that was taught at school. And it turns out that there's lots and lots of different ways of doing research and it's not all linear because the scientific method that create a hypothesis, work out an experiment to test the hypothesis, have some variables, not, no, just one variable, keep the other variables the same, repeat it. If it can be repeated by other people, it's a good experiment. Prove your thing or disprove your thing. That's rock solid if you want to know how fast a car is going or, um, you know, the angle of something in order to shoot it into space, stuff like that. But if you are trying to find out about people living their lives, you're as likely to miss something with that or to find out something not you what you find out with that is the answer to the question that you started with and if you don't start with the right question you find out a really convincing answer but it's no more use for you we need something that can look at things in multiple ways in order to understand the multi-dimensional nature of a life and so one of the research approaches that i read early on that I really liked, I read a lot of really dull ones as well, but is by a lady called Jennifer Mason. And she says that you should think of your research problem not as a single question, but you think of it as a gemstone. And then you think of ways to approach this gemstone. And she says when people are sort of fashioning a gemstone, they make some big cuts, you know, so you might do a big survey and count a load of things and that would be a big cut. But also there's all the little sort of intricate cuts on the top that just add to the light and the insight and the glints of, you know, understanding that you get from this gemstone. And so she talks about using multiple different methodologies in order to approach this gemstone from all angles. And it's not about saying that one of the approaches is the right way. It's recognising that different approaches on the same thing bring different gifts in terms of understanding. And I was thinking, if, if instead of research, we were thinking about this gemstone as being the lives of people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities, the lives of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities, and our sort of problem our you know our goal is to create a world in which these lives are better lived or easier to live or there's there's lots of different ways in which we do that isn't there there's the um the immediate needs of medical care and equipment provision there's some of the like the big cuts on that gemstone on the sides um if you are somebody who is parenting a child with complex disabilities those physical things like changing places toilets are an immediate like you need to do something about that right now but there are other ways of not solving this problem but you know approaching this gemstone and different people can do different jobs you know I'm not the parent 
of somebody with a complex disability. And there's a lot of things that I can't do. But the geeky bit is a bit that I can do. And so I, I, <laughs> I just, just to add to the geeky references, I was going to say that it's a bit like Star Trek. Um, it, if, if you, um, uh, <laughs> I didn't watch Star Trek myself, just all my friends did. So I studied maths and further maths, which is that's the level of geekdom we're looking at here. And the Star Trek, the um, my understanding of how the world of Star Trek works is that all the people do the job that is the job they're best able to do. So there's no kind of hierarchy. Um, everybody is equal, but you're expected to do the best thing that you can do. And so when I look at this gemstone of people with profound disabilities, I look and think, which bit can I do? Like, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm all right at passing on. I, I say, I, I often say I try to be a bridge between research and practice. So I'm all right at taking the research that's often written in a way that's not particularly accessible and sort of expressing that in a way that's more practical, more tangible to people. That's what I do on all of my training days and all of the courses that you might have done with me. It's me being yogurt pot telephone between research and practice, taking the information from research and bringing it to you and then taking information from you and, and putting it back that way. I'm that yogurt pot telephone. And that's what I've been doing for 10 years is being the yogurt pot telephone. And when I started the PhD, it's because I thought I might be able to do this other bit of it too. And there are other people better placed than me, better able than me to do the other aspects of it. Like I used to be a teacher in a special school and I supported children with profound and multiple learning disabilities in my classroom. And I'm all right at it, but I'm not great as a teacher. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm autistic and my being autistic creates communication barriers between me and other people that I don't always know how to overcome. And so I get into muddles and working in groups of people uh, just takes... And in all, I can do it, but it takes so much capacity that there's very little of me left over for doing anything else. And even in really sort of low key ways that you wouldn't expect. Like, um, do you remember a few years ago, I was one of the editors for PMLD Link. I have never been more excited to have a role than to have that one. Because as a geek, I have a favorite journal and obviously it's PMLD Link. Um, if, if you're not already a subscriber and the PMLD conference is for you, PMLD link is also for you. The subscription fee for a year is tiny and you get access to all of their back catalogue, which again, if you enjoy the event today and having all of these different presentations available to you, the PMLD link back catalogue will make your year. It's just brilliant. Um, and I was invited to be an editor and I was so thrilled. And then I was so overwhelmed by being a part of the editorial team and trying to operate within a social landscape that's more than just me, that I quit. You know, there are definitely things I can't do. Um, and this is the bit that I can do, this bit of translating the research across and <laughs> sort of the bit of doing the research. Maybe, like I'm geeky enough that I can read all the stuff, but this only works as a part of the answer if other people are alongside me it's like being a little cog you know I'm this cog this is the bit I can do and if other co like if I can do this research and then I can convey it in a way that is meaningful to people caring for people with profound and multiple learning disability or people teaching them or people then my understanding will kind of mesh and and it will create an effect somewhere else but it only works if if you're with me on it, it doesn't work in isolation. Um, so yeah, so that's that's why I'm doing it. It's because this is the bit I can do. It's been a very humbling experience because I had thought at the start of it that I would have a choice at the end of it, you know, because the expectation on me now in my final year of my doctorate 
is that I will be looking for postdoc positions, that I will go on in academia and carry on being an academic. And my experience of being in academia for the past three years has been lovely, but it has taught me that it's not accessible to me in the same way that being a journal editor at PMLD Link wasn't something I could manage. I don't think I can survive within the machinery of the institutions. Um, so I thought I would have to make this choice at the end of the PhD. Do I go back to running the sensory projects or do I continue in academia and doing all this geeky stuff that I love? And I don't have a choice. But So I can be sad about that, but I can also be incredibly grateful because there's, there's lots of people who get to the end of their doctorates and, and don't get a postdoc and don't have something else. Whereas I have the sensory projects. I have a way that I can be a part of, you know, solving this puzzle. And I have people like you guys who are close enough to me that that we can all sort of cog together. I hope this is still making sense. Maybe I should put up pictures. Yeah, so that's, that's why I'm doing it for me personally. It's because this is the bit. I think I can do and I think it's useful and then why I think it's useful is more than just it's good to have evidence-based practice it's the value of representation in research for people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities which can seem like when you're um back to my gemstone <laughs> when you're directly supporting somebody with profound disabilities and they need a new epilepsy regime or their um, chair is the wrong shape for them or you can't get them to engage with the activities you're doing you have a very immediate need to know a particular thing or to solve a particular part of this problem you don't get to choose which side of this gemstone you're looking at because it's this one that needs sorting now and it, having a, a sort of an understanding that it's important for this person to be represented in research feels really really distant and vague <laughs> But there's a value to it and I'm you know I'm your girl for the distant and vague because representation in research has an impact on policy at a really sort of basic level when government ministers decide what they're putting into a, a policy or a provision or something they've got a bunch of 20 something politics graduate students who are doing a year as an intern working for free in order to be a part of the machinations of politics and they'll say to these you know 20 somethings go and find out what the research says about this and those young people go through the academic databases you know using the, those of you who are doing the pmld masters if you're not doing the pmld masters that's another great one um go you know you put in search terms you find out you're like what do we know what do the scientific community know about the most effective way to treat sewage or what do we know about how to care for people with disabilities? They put that in, they create a briefing for the government minister, they sort of, you know, they write an essay summarising it all, and then they go, Fudum. there you go. And that's what people judge stuff on. And at the moment, there's a very real risk that if those things happen, people with PMLD aren't even mentioned. They're not, they don't, they don't exist at that level of consideration. And without their existence, they don't get considered and then they don't get provided for. And we see that. You, you can, you would have experienced tangible examples of that. If you um, work in education, the, the latest um, SEN edict from above, what's the big, you'll all be shouting it at the screen. You know the thing I mean, the big thing, they go, this is how you provide for children with special needs. There's mention, I think they're mentioned once in it, like as like a, in brackets, if you've got students with PMLD, you'll need to do something else. And then you look at the populations of our special schools and they're not an in brackets population. They are a big population and they are a growing population, but they're not considered in that documentation because they don't exist in research. And the other horrible one was the do not resuscitate policies that were automatically put onto the um, medical records of people with profound disabilities during the pandemic. If they don't exist there, if, they, if they're not seen there, then they don't get considered. So I think there is a real value in just having them represented in research in whatever form that might be. And so we need inclusive research. 
So that was my little first bit. That was my why I'm doing it. This is my little bit on inclusive research. So inclusive research is an awesome thing. Um, it, you had, uh, do you remember the when the disabled rights movement really sort of kicked off for real in the late 80s, early 90s? I was about, oh, I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's fine. I was about 10. And I remember, I remember them storming Telethon. So I know that lots of you are watching from around the world, which is really exciting. And when I get the ticket sales information, you're like, oh, New Zealand, China. It's it's like this. We are a global community of people approaching this problem. It's a lovely thing. Um, but in the UK, we used to have, I say used to. It's not really in the past, is it? Once a year or twice a year, we used to have telethon where they would parade the poor little disabled children and beg for money. And then you, people would phone in. And as you watched it on television, there would be these big um, banks of telephones with people answering the telephone. And the host would stand at the front and go, Julie, who have you got on your phone? And Julie would go, oh, I've got Mrs. So-and-so from Lyme Regis. And how much is Mrs. So-and-so from Lyme Regis donating? Julie, oh, she's going to give £20 that she would have spent on a curry. And and that was it. The idea was that disabled people were to be pitied. And um, through our good nature, we would gift them the pity for people money. And the disabled rights movement were really not happy about this. They were like, we don't want handouts. We would like jobs, please. If you would just put some ramps into buildings, we could get in those buildings and work. And then you could stop treating us like objects of pity. And some really good, like, punky characters stormed Telethon and told them all to stuff it. And they stormed Breakfast TV. And I, I remember things like this happening. And their cry was nothing about us without us. Like, we want to do this. And they were campaigning on a social model of disability, saying we're not um, less than, we just need equal access and we get equal access in these ways. And awesome campaign. Research at the time began to listen to that nothing about us without us, nothing about us without us, and began to look at how we can do research more inclusively. Because historically, research with regard to people with disabilities, research was done on them. And not in a not in a nice way, like the way that we do research on rice. <laughs> rice? We probably do do research on rice. Mice and rats, I, I put them all together in one. <laughs> the way we do research on rice. No, we used to do research on people with disabilities in the way that we do research on animals. They were considered less than, so they were an ideal object on which to test our new medicine, our new toothpaste, to poke things in their eyes. Horrible, horrible research history. Um, we moved from doing research on them in that way to doing research on them still, but now it was research that was something to do with them. So we tested their medicines on them and things like that. Still not great. Then we moved to doing research for them. So we only justified the research if it had benefit to them. So I can still test stuff on you. <laughs> I can still do awful things to you, but only if potentially it'll have some benefit to you. And as the inclusive research movement took off, which has been, it's about 20 years old, maybe a bit more, um, they moved from doing research on people, from research for people, to doing research with people with disabilities and if you want some glorious research reading reading inclusive research practice and and what I love about it so much is how honest researchers are when they write stuff up and I'm yeah you're like I've run loads of sensory projects that's why I'm called the sensory projects and when you run those projects you normally have an idea, like the art project, the idea was um, that people with profound and multiple learning disabilities would independently create their own works of art. It, art wouldn't be done to them, it would be done by them, it, it'd be, so, which is a lovely idea. And, and you work out how to do it. And so at the end of it, if you manage to do it, you have a load of lovely things to say. And I say all those lovely things. Um, but I don't say all the stuff that went wrong. I don't say the stuff that didn't work so well. I don't tell you about the ideas that just crashed and burned because you don't generally go, you don't go, generally go around sort of 
showcasing your weaknesses. And in the inclusive research movement, you'll have people go, right, we decided to do some research uh, with people with disabilities. So we got a group of people with disabilities and then we figured out how to do the survey and we did this and this. And at the end of it, they said that they felt patronised by us and some of it had been inclusive, but others of it... And they, they just put it all out there. It's, it's so honest and authentic and lovely. And researchers have moved in this very honest and reflective way through these various iterations of figuring out how to make research inclusive of people with disabilities. And we've got, you know, we've got huge strides in that. You even now, so we've gone from on to for to with, you now get research by people with disabilities. So people with disabilities lead the research, they're in charge of the questions, they decide what's going to happen, and they employ researchers with intellectual capacity to do various bits of the job for them, but they are underneath the people with disabilities rather than being supported, rather than the people with disabilities being supported. So there's this fantastic journey of inclusive research, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, but people with profound and multiple learning disabilities have rather been left behind on that journey. And indeed, some of the more recent stuff could act to exclude them, which is definitely not what the inclusive research movement is about. And it's got a horrible irony to it that something that pushes itself as inclusive research could end up being exclusive, could, but could basically end up being research is inclusive for those who have the intellectual capacity to learn how to do research. So a lot of the inclusive research has been about how we communicate the things that we do in research at a level at which somebody with an intellectual disability can understand. So it's been breaking things down into smaller chunks, having visual representations of things. And so if you have, you know, for example, if you have somebody who has Down syndrome, they can, by having these things broken down into steps, they can learn how to do this process and one day be able to do it just like the other researcher. But somebody with a profound intellectual disability, it doesn't matter how much you break down those steps, they're not going to get to a point where they can do that if, if they can get to a point where they can do that, they're not somebody with a profound intellectual disability, they're somebody with a moderate intellectual disability, and so we're still in the same you know, conversation. Um, and what's happened is, as the value of inclusive research has been recognised, the people who fund research have very rightly said, we will only fund you if you do this inclusively, because we don't want to be funders of the on research, or the, you know, we want to fund inclusive research, which then means that somebody needs to decide what's inclusive and what's not. And so you get lists of inclusive researchers, this, 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 and this. And the researchers who create those lists, create them in that very honest and reflective way that research is written. They're going, we think it's this, but they're not going, it's this and everybody must obey us. They're just going, this is our description of inclusive research. But the funders go, right, so we've got a checklist here. Yep, check, check, check. No, nope, not inclusive, can't fund you. And so if on your list of what inclusive research is, you have something like uh, the people with disabilities must come up with the question that's being studied, how is that going to happen for somebody with a profound intellectual disability? It's, you can't, it's not one that you can fulfil, and so your research doesn't get funded, you don't get able to do that research. Or I, I saw one research paper got me really like stomping my feet where they wrote they were writing about how they'd um, chosen the people that they were working with and they just in one sentence went it was necessary to exclude the people with profound disabilities because they got profound disabilities you're like no <laughs> you can't that's surely not a justification like they did after that they did a beautiful piece of inclusive research with a, with a group of people with mild and moderate and you know, a group of people who have intellectual disability but not a profound level of intellectual disability. So the research that they did was really lovely. It was just that the, the dismissal of people with PMLD was just one sentence. You're like, well, it was necessary. We couldn't do it with them. And that's the idea, isn't it? The idea is that research is inherently an intellectual pursuit. And so if you don't have intellectual capacity, you can't be a part of research. And so 
I'm going to move on into my third little bit where this is, I'm going to tell you what I've been doing now. This is the point at which if you want to get off or if you want to pause and come back, like when you've had more sugar, um, go for it because I, I'm, I'm going to try and give you like the whole contents of my thesis in about half an hour, do you reckon? Um, and it's it will sound, you know, if, if what you're interested in at the event today is like a practical idea that you can use in your classroom tomorrow or a contact for a campaign or something like that. If you're needing one of the immediate things, this is one of those, like if you hold the gemstone really far away and look at it from a funny angle, you might just see a spark, you know, it's, it's such an exciting spark and I love it. But it's, it's that sort of a thing. So I love you all. And if you're leaving now, bye bye. If you're staying, come along for the, for the geekery. So in order to do research with somebody who has a profound intellectual disability, I need a conception of research that doesn't rely on intellectual capacity. And I need a methodology that we can share together. And so I need a methodology in which meaning is apprehendable at the point of experience. Because if we're, what we're doing in research is we are finding out new stuff, aren't we? We're, 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 we're having a look from a different side, we're accessing new meaning or we're experiencing meaning in a different way. Um, we're, we're going towards something with curiosity. And you can think, you, you have to think about where meaning is located you know it's often in a western conception in a cartesian a descartian conception of meaning meaning is often something that's thought of as in something to be extracted so like i've got knowledge in my head and you extract it by asking me questions that's the understanding of meaning that underpins every survey you've ever taken you know or there's um knowledge in the environment and we test for it by doing that very linear testing of have a hypothesis test you know create a test check your answers that sort of thing so i have to find in order to start this research a methodological standpoint in which myself and the people with profound intellectual disabilities that i worked with can experience meaning together as equals um so there were kind of two schools of thought that I played with and these are not right or wrong I'm not saying that the approach that I used is the right way to think about things it's very much it's like you can look at it this way or you can look at it this way and in looking at it this way I found that I was able to do research with people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities whereas looking at it that way I couldn't um so I'm gonna I'm going to go through this really quickly um, and if you want to understand any bit of it more, I can definitely talk about each bit of it more. But this is just like to hold things up and show things. So what I was playing with was Cartesian dualism and phenomenology. So Cartesian dualism is from Descartes and it's that I think therefore I am. And he said that we are a mind in a body. And in Cartesian dualism, your mind is like, that's you, that's where you do all your thinking, and your body is just the vehicle that you move around in. So it's like your mind is the driver of the car, and your body is the car. The important thing is the driver, the car is just a material resource. And Cartesian dualism so underpins um, the way we look at, the way we teach in schools, the way we look at stuff, it underpins how we think about ourselves, especially in the Western world. We are soaked in this stuff. It's like we're always looking at the gemstone from one side to the point at which we think that, like there is only one side to the gemstone. And if you were trying to do research with somebody, I did some paintings. I um, I did A-level art, but I didn't do, I think I got a C, which is a low grade for a geek. Um, but you wouldn't expect a geek to do well at art. So I've been trying to paint my thesis because in a few weeks' time, I have to present it in 12 minutes. So I think I marginally gave myself half an hour when I was talking to you just then. 
Um, but if you're doing a Cartesian dualist approach of research with people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities, you end up in a situation like this, where the real person is inside the body. I've actually put us in our hearts here, haven't I? You could have put us in our heads. The real person is inside the body and the body is just the box that that person is kind of carried around in. And if you're looking to understand somebody else, you're trying to understand what's inside them from witnessing what their outsides do. So, you know, you try to understand the driver from noticing the actions of the car. And if you have a driver who can't necessarily control their car, who can't produce language, you are guessing at what's going on. You don't get to meet them. You just, you, the, the bit that you can access, genuinely access from the outside is what they look like. You only have first-hand access to the body. You don't meet the person inside. And so under a Cartesian lens, it's very difficult to find a way to occupy a meaningful space with somebody with a profound intellectual disability in which you could do research. Whereas in phenomenology, I mean, have I got a picture for, <laughs> oh, somewhere, you know that mind and body, phenomenology doesn't have us as a mind and a body, we are a mind body. It's, because it so underpins us, we don't actually have words in our language I have to sort of try and squish mind and body to get they're saying it's not two separate things because there is no meaning without a body like the word hot doesn't mean anything unless you have a body to experience hot there's no meaning to our experiences unless there is feeling that accompanies them and so you have to be both things and there isn't a separate there isn't a physiological like obviously your brain is up here but it's wired to everything else isn't it it is all we are all one thing and so I've been using phenomenology and I've been particularly inspired by a French phenomenologist called Merleau Ponte who wrote the phenomenology of perception and in the phenomenology of perception he's trying to describe the experience of life as lived rather than the experience of what happens in life so that sounds it sounds immediately like nonsense but it's not so he's saying that there is a difference between the way things are and the way that you experience things so a really easy example of this is one of those optical illusions you have you seen the optical illusion where you get two lines that are the same length and then one has pointy arrows that way and the other has pointy arrows that way and so one line I'll put it up if I can one line looks shorter than the other if you approach those lines through the natural sciences you know if, if you ask physics to tell you about those lines it will tell you that the lines are the same length but your experience of living those lines is of experiencing the lines as different lengths and so Merleau-Ponty says there's a value in describing the experience of living. We're not saying that the, the lines are the same length. We're saying that the experience of them, is, of them is the same length. And so in the phenomenology of perception, he's trying to describe the experience of living. And it's really beautiful and dense and complicated. But he said, one of the things he said is we are not in our bodies as an object is in a box. We are in the world and, and ourselves as the heart is in the organism. We're meshed, we're a part of this, we're of, we, we, it's all connected. And he said that we experience ourselves as a movement towards the world. So, and that's directed by intention. So like, if I want to have a drink, I, the reason that I want to have a drink is because um, somewhere in my brain sensors have told me that I'm a bit dehydrated and so that those sensors have told me that and then they send a message to the part of my brain that controls my arm and my arm extends and opens my drink and I have a drink. That's the natural science explanation of what happens. But that's not what we experience when we want a drink. We don't experience all those you know connections and things he says what we experience is the is the thirst 
and then we place our intention into the cup, into the vessel. So my intention is with the cup and then we experience ourselves as a movement towards it. I always have homo symptoms, like, it's like drink, drink. It's like you're, you're, you experience yourself as a movement of intention towards the object. And that really resonates with me. That's definitely, you think, yeah, yeah, I do. I experience myself as a movement towards the world. And so in that situation, if you're working out how to approach somebody with profound intellectual disabilities in order to do research together, to apprehend meaning together, you're not approaching them as an object in a box, you know. You're approaching them with an understanding that they are somebody who has intentional flow. They are a movement of consciousness through time. So you might have, here's my, <laughs> here's my pictures. So you have somebody who is moving towards the world. Obviously, you can move towards the world in physical movement, but you can also move towards the world in vocal expression, and you can move towards the world without movement at all. You know, it's the direction of your consciousness that we're talking about, rather than the sort of ambulation of a particular part of you. And so if I want to do research with somebody with PMLD, I was looking at how to understand that intentional flow. And the task that I was set in my PhD is to study identity and belonging for people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. And I've, I've done the belonging in a different kind of a way because a lot of the inclusive research movement has been putting the inclusion as the goal. Like we are trying to create something in which these people with disabilities that we're doing this research with will feel included. So I've got, oh, let's see how my lighting is going. There you go, it's a journey. And at the end of it is the goal. And that's what they're aiming for. And I'm going with belonging, which is a felt space of inclusion. It's a lot more than that, but it's a good shorthand. And I didn't want to do anything without them. So I was trying to position it not as the end goal that we're working towards, but as the foundations for the journey at, at every point. I've got little bricks under my road in my picture. And so in order to do research with people with profound intellectual disabilities, I need to be with them before we do anything. That withness underpins it all. And obviously, I can go and sit with them and I can talk to them, but intensive interaction with them, um, and I can find out all about them. But sometimes there's a withness to that and sometimes there's not. And this is one of those things that I will really struggle to put into nice, neat words in the thesis. But I think you'll understand if you support people with profound disabilities. Like, I can be sharing time and space with somebody. I can be sharing an activity with them. Um, you know, they can be reacting and it can be going really well, but you don't feel a, a withness, a sort of a sense of connection. And then at other times, you could just be doing relatively little, but you feel really with that person. I need more words. This is the nice thing about phenomenology, is if, if I go and read it, I will find a set of words that describe these experiences, that are experiences that we have, but are experiences that are very difficult to articulate using the language of the natural sciences. So what I'm aiming to do when I work with somebody with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities is to figure out in which direction their intention is flowing. And that's what I was doing when I was um, working with the people who I've collaborated with. And it was really interesting because like with one of the young people that I worked, I've got some paintings that are loosely of them. So this is Senan, and I'll put a picture up of Senan next to this. But her intention was towards her hand and she was very interested in, and you could feel that kind of the flow of her, unless she was in pain when it was pulled away from her or she felt ill when it was moved somewhere, 
that's where she was like going to. And so I was trying to meet her in that space. And then with somebody else, with Becky, when I worked with Becky, when I first met Becky, she was, she didn't really have control of her own intention. Because this is the other lovely thing. If you're the heart in the organism, it's not just you acting on the world. The world acts on you too. And what you would see when Becky moved about her classroom was that a loud noise would kind of yank her intention that way and a bright light would kind of pull her intention that way. And I was trying to draw in my little painting, I was trying to draw her like one of those, you know, those balls where the you've got a little ball in the middle and all the like wavy light comes out around. There'll be a name for them. She was like that. The, the world was kind of pulling at her and she couldn't control her attention. And over the year that we worked together, I actually saw her change spaces and in, and get control of her intention more. And then it was like she was, it was like um, like a searchlight on a wonky platform. It would like whoop, veer at you and be there. And so I would spend time with them, looking for where their intention was, and then trying to bring my intention into that same place, because I was aiming to co-locate our intention. And so here's, um, where's, oh, just in a mess of bits of paper now. I had the, okay. So that's doing research with people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities through a Cartesian dualist lens. We sit there trying to extract the meaning inside each other and not actually able to directly apprehend it. This is doing research with people with profound and multiple learning disabilities through a phenomenological lens. So the blue is our intentional flows. And I've been, I'm sat there trying to work out where her intention is. And I figure it's towards this movement of her foot that's kicking. And so I'm trying to direct my intention there. And this bit here, see where the two lines meet? That's when you feel the whiff. When your intention moves in the same direction together with another person. It's, it's like it, you end up with all these weird philosophical questions. So you're like, what is it to be alive? And the Cartesian one would be it's to have a body with a brain in it that's active. And you're like, yeah, I have those things. But is that the experience of life or is it consciousness that's the experience of life? And then what's consciousness? It's a, what is it? And they describe it as a as a movement through time, and time is one of. If you want a geeky, a really geeky tangent, time is one of the places where the natural sciences fall short because they can't describe it. They can only do it as a flick book account of time. They can't describe the flow of time. They just put more pages in their flick book. Whereas phenomenology can describe the movement of time as the movement of consciousness. But that really is a tangent. That's we're well away from that. But if you imagine that what we are as consciousnesses is currents in an ocean. So here's my ocean <laughs> and there's all the currents. What the, what the person is, is one of those currents. So they are in the ocean, they are a part of the ocean, they are connected and they are, they are affected by the rest of the ocean. There's not a separation between the mind and the body. There's not a separation between the body and the world. There's just this current. If you wanted, as if you were one of the currents in the ocean and you wanted to know another current, knowing the direction their intention is going is useful, but it's not the most important thing because what you're trying to do is if you've got that current flowing here, you're trying to bring your current up to it, but you don't want to push it off course because then you change what that current is. So you've got one current flowing like this. You've got to approach with enough speed to get there, but as you get there, you've got to change your angle so that as you get there, you flow like this. And if you can flow like that, that's your intentions. It's like intention is the vector information for your consciousness. If you flow like that, that's what's happening down there. There's our different currents. And then here's the bit where we flow together. So what's happening there is your intention, your movement towards the world is together with another person's. 
And as you move towards the world, that's a movement towards new meaning, towards new experience, towards apprehending new understanding. If you do that together, then that is doing research with somebody because you are approaching new meaning together. And so my task in the PhD was identity and belonging. So I'd got belonging in the methodology. My idea was I'm not going to request their belonging. I'm going to mandate it from the start. I am not prepared to do anything. I'm not going to move forwards doing any research unless we're in it together and we feel a sense of belonging. And as another tangent and a useful tangent, probably, if you're doing any sort of work with people with profound multiple learning disabilities, is to think about consent and assent. So a huge chunk of my thesis will be about the assent process, which is that I'm willing to do this and that they also have to be willing to do this. I asked people's families if they'd be happy for me to work with them, but I that was step one, you know. I didn't work with anybody who didn't also indicate it, that they wanted to work with me because we're doing research together. So I've chosen to do the research. You also have to choose to do the research. And there's a whole load of versions of this where they go, well, they've got profound disability, so they can't. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying they've got profound disability, so we have to listen to it in a different way. So if I've got belonging, then and we're trying to do research together, I need a topic to do research about, don't I? Because we can't do research together unless we're researching something. Um, this, this just, we just had a paper published yesterday. I'm recording the day after our second paper got published. And it very, well, there were four reviewers. Three of them thought it was great. One of them thought it was terrible. And the one that thought it was terrible was really cross that we hadn't reported what we'd found out about um, people with profound intellectual disabilities and I did we did say to them that's because this isn't research about people with profound it's not on people it's not about them it's not on people with profound intellectual disabilities it's research that's been done with them so you know like tomorrow on the news when they announce a new drug for can cancer nobody will say why isn't this telling us something about the researcher because it wasn't about the researchers and in my work the researchers are me and the people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities with whom I'm collaborating and so when I report the findings of my work I'm not reporting stuff about them I'm reporting stuff that we found together but reviewer two just couldn't handle that um, so what we were studying was identity and Merleau-Ponty came up trumps for me again because he was describing um, how we meet ourselves when we meet objects. So there's lots and lots of different conceptualizations of identity and another geeky tangent is available if you want to know some of the many um, different conceptualizations of identity. But in order to do research with people with profound intellectual disabilities, I needed a conceptualization of identity that they can share. So ones that are based on an understanding of roles in society that you then reflect on are not ones that we can share. So I went with a phenomenological appreciation of identity. And so Merleau-Ponty says, when I touch the flask, I discover that the flask is smooth and cold. And I also discover that I am somebody who touches smoothness and coldness. And so in the meeting of the flask, there is a meeting of self. And so I was figuring if we could recognise ourselves against objects, that recognition of self would be a form of identity. And I brought in lots of novel objects to the field. So I've got ping pong ball sleeves and oily carp lent me their giant thread and frozen light lent me a 12 foot vibrating grey rope thing. And I've had all sorts of odd things that I took into the field. The field makes it, I always think that makes it sound like a war zone, but that is how it's referred to in research. I took them into a classroom, um, into the field. I took these objects in to give us that opportunity of meeting ourselves against the objects. And partly the reason that they were such extraordinary objects is because I needed them to be extraordinary in order to, for me to notice myself against them because I don't generally go around going, oh, I am a person who experiences smoothness. And, but when I put on ping pong ball sleeves, I think, ooh, like, ooh, this is weird. And you, in that kind of ooh, 
you're meeting an aspect of self. And so I had these extraordinary objects and my plan was that together we would ask questions about who we were with these objects. So I'm there wearing the ping pong ball sleeves thinking, who am I with the ping pong balls? <laughs> or um, who am I with the giant egg? And I was asking these questions and I wasn't really finding any answers. What answer would you find? 42, you're 42. But I did find a use to the weird objects because they tended to act as intentional pulls. So when you take a, a giant blue egg into the classroom that wobbles and makes a noise, quite often you find that it directs intentional flow, that it's, it acts like a magnet towards the intentional flow of the people around, and not just the people with profound and multiple learning disabilities by any means. The first time I took the giant blue egg in, I think I had all the staff in the room and possibly the deputy head as well. It's just all like, ooh. <laughs> intentional flow and so they were quite useful in finding a way to be with that person in the flow of their intention because if their flow went towards the object I could direct my flow towards the object and then you would meet but it's a bit of a, a dead end aspect in that way <laughs> so I spent a year working with Becky and Felicity and Charlena and Senan, who hopefully whose images have been popping up beside me as you've been watching this, asking these questions, trying to do research with them about identity, asking who am I with the egg, who am I with the ping pong balls, and also asking it in relation to objects that they brought into the research encounter. So Becky was who am I with the sticks, Charlena had various objects that she often had with her, who am I, who am I with these things. Um, and I never really answered the questions, but a really interesting thing happened, which was that when we were doing research and our intentions were co-located, I asked the questions in a different way. I would ask, who are we with the sticks? Who are we with the egg? And that we, wasn't a recognition that there was two people there because there'd always been two people there that's that was there all along it was a recognition that there was no longer a separation between us as we approached the object as we approached our own embodiment i would when i said who am I with the egg? I was pointing, that I points to me. And when later, when we were in that being with each other state, I would say, who are we with the egg? I was still pointing in the same direction with that word. It's just that my experience of self at that point wasn't as being isolated. It was of being with. And it's, it, here you go, here's some intentional flows. This is actually, this is Becky in her first classroom where her intentions like pulled out of her in all directions, all the noises, and this is me trying to figure out where she is. And then as she entered her second classroom and the um, environment was more suited to her, her intentional flow became more discernible. And so I was able to do a better version of it. And then through time, I worked out how to locate her. I say I. There were some really extraordinary times when Becky located her intention with me rather than me locating mine with her, which if you're reading the thesis, we had to look out for. But this is two separate people. And here, where they begin to touch, there's no longer two separate people. There is two people. It's... It's the whole being, the sum of its parts. At that level of embodied encounter with self, we were not eyes, we were we's. And so my finding with regards to intention, and uh, with regards to identity, is that at an embodied level, identity can be shared. And there's a beautiful parallel. It's like it, it loops all the way back round 
to the natural sciences and the hard sciences and maths and things because identity originally was a mathematical concern we were trying to define as we defined identity what one thing is and what the other thing is so that we could count one two like that's a thing that's a thing that's a thing we are identifying units in the world and so identity starts in research as this concern of identifying isolated objects and the same um, branches of research that did that early on so maths and some like weird ends of physics and things like this now admit of fuzzy boundary identities where they recognize that there are things that are distinct there's a thing there's a thing but not separate and i have a colleague who's also doing um she's researching the same puzzle as me but coming at it from a completely different angle i've been painting my thesis she may well knit her thesis she's called catherine and she had a daughter called johanna who I met a few years ago on um, a sensory story day um, and early on in my work as a doctoral student I had to do a presentation to the Centre for Research and Inclusion at Southampton University where I'm based and this is a centre full of researchers way more senior than me who know way more about everything than me and I thought anything that I stand up and say is instantly going to reveal me as a twit. <laughs> So I'm not going to stand up and tell them anything. I will just stand up and ask them a list of questions. And at that time, I was reading into identity and the many different forms of identity that are described in research. And so I stood up and I just asked a list of questions about identity. I was like, it just literally, it was a five minute list of questions about identity. And as I sat back down, Catherine was sitting next to me and she leant over and she was quite frustrated. She said, I didn't know who you were expecting me to answer as. I was like, because well, I'd been asking, like, am I the same person when I'm with my family as when I'm with my friends? Who, who am I? You know, nobody else in that room was confused as to who all the identity questions had been about, apart from Catherine, who has lived 34 years with Johanna, who has a profound and multiple learning disability. And what I found in the work trying to establish a research encounter of being with, a research encounter in which our intentions and our consciousness is flowed together, was that at the start of it, I would occasionally experience this. I'd be, I'd be working with somebody and I'd be trying to figure out where their intention and there would just be like a flicker of a moment where you feel like, yeah, I'm properly with you, and then it would be gone. Or it would be there. There was one time when I'd got, when I was like, that's it, I'm, I'm with them. And I was thinking, how do I get an identity question into this? Like, if I stand up to go and get the egg or a ping pong ball sleeve, it, 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 at the start, it was like a soap bubble. You know, it would be there momentarily. It was incredibly fragile and sometimes it would pop and go away. And towards the end, it became a mode of being where I would walk into the space and with two of the researchers in particular, we didn't need to establish it. It was already there. And it was... Yeah, it was a mode of being. And you think, I think, and I'd love for people who've made it this far through to say in the comments whether this is something that you experience too. But I think that over time spent with people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities, if you are looking to attune and stuff like that, there is that lack of separateness. And I borrow, I'm going to borrow from Grayson Perry because I saw him describe this. He said, um, we think of ourselves as these, um, I, I can't remember what he said properly, but they, I understood it as we think of ourselves as this. We think of ourselves as this hidden thing in a box, in like hard outer shell that people can't get through. And he said, but actually we're more like clouds. Yeah, there's a cloud and there's a cloud. And when two clouds come together, they merge a bit, these fuzzy boundary identities at an embodied level we have fuzzy boundary identities and I think doing research with people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities is one of the best ways of learning to understand these things and some of do you remember at the start I said there's this list of things that have to constitute inclusive research 
Another thing that often pops up on the list is that the research has to be for the people that are doing it. And actually, I think in a future world where we're understood as equal from the get go, regardless of our physicality and our intellectual capability, we'll recognise that there's a worth in collaborating with different people on different topics just, you know, because it's a valuable thing to do. So I'm hoping that by doing this PhD, I contribute a bit of understanding to this puzzle. I create a representation of them in the research archives and that has, you know, a little drip effect on policy clout down the line. And and maybe we also contribute something to just sort of a general understanding. But you've been really gorgeous to listen to me for so long. I hope some of it made sense. I'll try and put pictures along. I filmed myself this way up rather than that way up because I thought I'll I'll patch in pictures to make it make more sense. Um, but by the end of the year, if I don't lose the plot completely, there should be a thesis with it all in, carefully articulated. And there are already two papers published. One's called um, Doing Research Inclusively and the other's, I can't remember what the other one's called because it only came out yesterday and if I say it now and get it wrong, I'll look really silly. Um, but I'll put them up and they are both free to view. So if you would like to read them, you don't have to pay, go through a paywall or anything like that because they've been funded to be free to view. So thank you very much for listening to me today and thanks for coming to the event. And I, yeah. I'll be really interested to see what you read, see what you write.